So market keeps getting, um, I don't know, better, worse. Interest rates, uh, they went down. We had a glut of hope. And now they're starting to creep up just a little bit. And we're starting to enter the holidays, the worst part of the year to try to sell a house, but the best time of year to buy a house. So stick around. Let's going to find out what is going on. Hey everybody, it's Eric out in Las Vegas. And as always, if you ever wanna contact me about real estate, call, text, or email. Information's in the info tab. And if you wanna get on my calendar, just click down below, get that calendar link, and we can find a time to get together and you can dedicate those 15 minutes for us to talk. Today we have Andrea Fernandez with us today. Uh, this is kind of a makeup session from what happened this weekend. I uh, had some really severe internet problems. So said we're going to bring her back, get those questions answered while we were having a little bit, bit of buffoonery. And uh, she is from Planet Home Lending. And we're going to try to finish up that conversation or at least do it in a way where you're going to be able to get everything done today. So, Andre, glad you're able to come back and talk to us this week. And we'll try to go through this process again. And I do apologize for the buffoonery of the weekend. Uh, I guess I have to put a new one in, restart the computer and restart the internet. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's uh, start off with uh, kind of the big gorilla in the room now. How are interest rates doing? Right, well, first of all, thank you Eric, for having me back. Excited here, but hey, that's the beauty of live streaming, right? Something can always go wrong, but um, we're here with great material. Um, and yeah, the question out there is, how are the interest rates? So we were kind of lucky last week. It was kind of like, I was like so excited because inflation numbers came back and they were actually a lot lower than we expected. We were expecting inflation numbers to be around 8% and they came a little bit lower to 7.7%. .7%. So the market freaked out in a good way. Rates went down. We're already around 7.5 at that point, like mid sevens. And then it literally went down to like mid six, even in some cases, lower, like lower six. So we're like, oh my gosh, we're going to a great, you know, we're finally going out of this bad um, stream on, you know, high rates. And we're going back to basics. And so how is this week going? Uh, so far, it's been doing okay in the in the sense that the rates are still um, on the six, but we are seeing a little bit of increase every day. We're losing a little bit of the gain of the momentum that we have last Wednesday, but it's still not as bad. Uh, so right now we're probably in the average of, you know, 6.5, 6.8, um, maybe going towards that 7%, but we'll see how the market keeps trading in, in that area. Okay. Um, you, me, I don't know. Number one question I have for my clients right now, is it a good time to buy right now, right? So rates are still a little bit high, but there's opportunity. And I tell you why, two main reasons. Right now is a great time to buy because you can negotiate the price of your home. Okay, so we see a lot of people actually coming down in prices, maybe 20, even 50 so this is the time where you as a buyer can negotiate the purchase price. Another thing that I've seen a lot is that most of my contracts today, they have closing costs help from the seller. So they're asking for concessions. Um, I don't know if a lot of our clients were looking a few months back, but if you remember back then, we actually have bidding wars. People were putting $50,000 above the asking price. So we're not seeing that. We're actually seeing the reverse. We finally seen people getting closing costs and we haven't seen that in months. So tell me, Eric, um, I know you're the expert in the sense of like, you're the realtor. Are you seeing the prices of the homes really coming down? Well, they're not coming down as much as you would suspect they would come down. Uh, we're probably going to see another adjustment by the end of the month. But we also remember, this is the time of year when housing is very soft. Mm -hmm. uh, so what we're saying is, it's really difficult to understand. We have more uh, houses out there and fewer buyers. So economics is just plainly supply and demand, right? Well, the supply has gone up, the demand has gone down, prices should just plummet. Well, they're not. 
it's like there is no crash whatsoever. And it's befuddling, to be honest. Uh, I don't know. Everything is being driven by the interest rates. Uh, we were talking a little bit before, and you're talking about how people are having an issue with their comfort level with interest rates. Uh, what are you seeing with that comfort level? You know what? Affordability is definitely an issue. Um, if we compare actually um, the same home, the same price, the same client, they've been losing about twenty, even $50,000 of approval just because the payment is a lot higher for the same property. Um, so definitely that's an issue. It's getting difficult for people to be able to afford these payments just because the rates are a little higher. And the bad part is that the houses are really not coming down that much, right? Mm -hmm. But right. something that I've been telling all my clients, you have to date the rate and marry the home, right? Mm -hmm. What does that mean? You should definitely take advantage on all the perks and all the money that you can get for your closing costs. I know it's going to be a little bit tough for maybe a year, a year and a half, and that you're paying a little bit of a higher payment. But then once you secure your home, you can always refinance and lower your payment. So you cannot, the fact that you get a loan today or a home today doesn't mean that you need to stick around with that loan forever. Like I said, expectations will be that interest rate are going to come down about in a year and a half to two years. And they're going to be about, about 5% is what I've been hearing a lot. So that's going to make a huge difference on your payment. If you're closing a home today at seven or six and a half, that's going to literally going to lower your payment about $200, $300 in some cases. Okay. Now, so when we're talking about the comfort level in payments uh, with the sellers being more willing to uh, help out, uh, they can actually help out with that interest rate too. There are multiple programs out there. Um, yeah. What do you got for me? So this is not a new program, funny enough. It's actually a program that is being used now because of the current situation. And it's called the buy down three, two, one or two, one buy down. So there's two options. So let's talk about option number one. So for example, you're trying to buy a home today and the rate is 7%. If you go for the three, two, one, down payment or oh, rate by down, you're going to get the first year, your payment will be based on the rate of um, for 5%. The second year, your rate is going to go up to 6%. And then the third year, your rate will go back to the normal rate of today market, which is 7%. However, something that may that you, lender may not be telling you is that there is a cost for having that break on the rate, okay? So this is something where it comes uh, handy to talk to your loan officer for them to explain to you what are the advantages or disadvantages of doing this because Eric, in life there's nothing free and there's always a cost related to that. So if it makes sense for you to do this, this uh, program is available to you and then that way you can have a more comfortable payment. Uh, there's another rule about this program is that the seller is the one that has to pay for that rate buy down. So most people will say, well, I'm not losing anything. My seller is going to pay for it. Yes, your seller is going to pay for that. But if you elect this option, you won't be able to use your closing costs, right? Because the seller is only going to pay you buy down on your closing costs just because there's some limits on how much money a seller can help you in a transaction. Okay. Okay. So, well, uh, now that you bring that up, let's talk about it because I know there are different amounts they're allowed to give you, um, like based on loan type, amount of down payment. Uh, just really quickly gloss over it a little bit, uh, like for each loan type, down payment amount, how much is a seller allowed to contribute? Great question. So FHA is actually really generous in that sense that we can go up to 6% um, contribution and that includes contributions from the seller of your realtor or any third party really uh, that is giving you and helping you with this loan so six percent for fha for conventional it really all depends on uh the type of property but for a primary home buyer uh you're actually limited to a three percent okay uh and if it's an investment property only two percent so those are like tricky things that we have to pay attention as to how much money um mm -hmm. is the seller allowed to contribute Mm -hmm. Okay. Come on now. You can skip my favorite type of loan. <laughs> come on, you know, come on. And for the BA loans, you're limited to a 4% contribution. Okay. Okay. 
So what, with the VA loan, you don't have any down payments or anything. You can get some contribution for the uh, a two three a two one or a three two one makes it a perfect combination, and uh, when we're talking about that, uh, we're talking about closing costs. What I've noticed a big part of those closing costs can be what the uh, lender charges. So, like for a VA loan, uh, some lenders charge what's known as an origination fee, which can be up to one percent. Uh, does your bank charge uh, origination fees? No, so for all our loans, um, my lender does only, they only charge underwriter and processing fee. And this mm -hmm. fee both together will be uh, $15.99. So regardless $15 of- $15.99, okay. And I include votes, which is actually really standard for the market. Okay, okay. But that's a great question. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, because I know, uh, let's say you're buying a $450,000 house, which is pretty close to the median right now. With some banks, that's an extra forty five hundred bucks you have to come up with. So, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, something very important, um, kind of related to the fees. Um, I know people always think about what's my rate. It sometimes I've been looking at a lot of advertisement, and some lenders are advertising four point nine percent when everybody's at six or six and a half, and you're like, how is this possible? But always read the fine print okay uh -huh. um it's very important that you don't always look at what interest rate i'm getting but rather how much are you paying for that interest rate right uh -huh. because a lot of people do not understand that there's a cost sometimes related to buying down their interest rate and a lot of cases it doesn't make sense to pay the extra money for a lower rate especially in this market why because most people that are buying right now they're not gonna remain with the same mortgage for the next 30 years most likely you're gonna be refinancing in the next i don't know four years or less so let's say if you buy down your rate from seven to six that can actually have a really high cost obviously it's a percentage of your purchase price so it depends on the type of property you're buying but sometimes it could cost you fifteen thousand dollars so that's when you really have to do the correct math and say, okay, is $15,000 really worth buying down the rate, right? Mm -hmm. So that's a difference where not all loan officers are made the same and maybe not all loan officers will give you that information and that knowledge for you to make educated decisions. Okay, okay, good. Well, uh, one of the things we're gonna talk about or did talk about this weekend that was all choppy and everything, uh, we're going to go over the uh, buying process a bit. So before we even get into the buying process, uh, I want to just discuss one thing or address it. Uh, one lender once told me, uh, people love the realtor. The realtor's like going to Disneyland. They get to go out and they get to see houses and it's, they love to dream and aspire. And uh, the lender is kind of like the, you know, the school principal or something. You go there when you're in trouble. You got to you know, confess everything or something. <laughs> so uh, no matter what, you may want to see houses. The one thing I've noticed is folks who uh, sit around going, oh, I know my credit's good. Let's just go look at houses and I'll just apply when time comes and I find the perfect house. Uh, you, you seen people do that before? <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, I hope I look nice enough to to have my clients comfortable to come and meet me. So, <laughs> right, right. no, but you're right. Sometimes uh, we are the one with the bad news because why? Once they come to my office, they may think that credit score is 700, but really you've run it and it's really 500 or something. Uh -huh. like that. Does it have anything to do with that uh, that that place that has a little bit of karma? They they uh, <laughs> go there and look up their credit score. Absolutely. Yeah. So you know what? I don't I don't mind credit karma. I kind of like it. And that's a great question, Eric, uh, that I have from my clients. They come to me and say, well, credit karma shows I'm 700. Well, I'm like 500 score, right? Mm -hmm. So the way how credit karma works is that they're not pulling your credit. What they're doing is estimating why your FICO score is based on your behavior. For example, if you maximize your credit card and you increase and you like you spend the entire living on your credit card, credit karma has 
these um, scenarios where like, okay, if you're maximizing your credit card, your score is probably gonna go down 20 points, right? And the next time you pay it, okay, maybe this is gonna bring you 10 points higher. But everything is really an estimate based on the data they receive. And they have never pulled your credit, okay? So it's not 100% um, accurate, but it can give you a good idea where you stand. So I still recommend it for my clients to be on top of their credit, see how it's moving up and down, because they do have a good idea. It's not always 100%. So be careful with that. What I recommend is always maintain your balance as low, okay? A lot of people ask me, Andrea, I always just pay the minimum because it's good to show that I'm utilizing my credit cards. But there's something wrong with that statement. Yes, it is important to utilize your credit cards, but that doesn't mean that you need to have a balance on your credit cards, okay? Just about utilization. So let's say if I use my credit card today, I can pay it up and that's helping my credit versus like, I'm just gonna leave a balance, okay? okay. But the most important thing is always leave your balances at least 30% of your credit limit. For example, if you have a credit card that is $1,000, you shouldn't spend more than $300. The moment your balance goes up, those three hundred dollars, your FICO score is gonna go a little bit lower. Okay. So be very careful with that. Um, also, authorized users. Okay, um, an authorized user account, in case that you don't know, is for example, I own a credit card and I would like Eric to use that credit card. So I'm like, hey, Eric, here's your credit card. You can use it. But technically, Eric is only an authorized user. He has privileged to charge my car, but he's technically not responsible on making the payments. So if I make a late payment, even though Eric is not responsible for it, Eric's credit is gonna be dinged, okay? okay? So you have to be, be careful when you you know share credit cards with somebody else that that person is maintaining their credit card the right way. Okay, okay. Uh, so the next one we're gonna talk about is I am somebody, a family, and I'm coming to you and you know, I'm listening to my realtor and talking to the lender first before I go out shopping for houses because I think I can buy a $600,000 house and find out I can buy a 350 or there was something on my credit I didn't know about. Uh, so there are different letters I'm gonna get from you after you've run my credit. So we can do a pre-qualification or a pre-approval, and we can even do some underwriting. Go over, and go over those for folks. Great question. So whenever you come to me, I'm most likely, or a lot of lenders use the pre-qualification letter. Um, what that means is that me as a your lender, uh, your loan officer, review your income documentation, run credit, run it through the system called DU and that system gave us an approval eligible. So you're pre-qualified because I did the homework as to review the basic information that we need, which is income, assets, liabilities, right? Mm -hmm. um, however, there's some lenders and some loan officers that must rather have a pre-approval letter um, issued to you. What is a pre-approval letter? It's actually the letter that is issued by the underwriter meaning I review the documentation, I send it to my underwriter and the underwriter is the person that actually gives you the final decision on the loan, okay? The underwriter is gonna make the determination based on the same income documentation that I show them, but then they're gonna say, okay, yeah, I feel very comfortable about this client and I'm gonna issue a pre-approval letter, okay? There's advantages on having that pre-approval letter. Obviously, when you go, to put an offer on a house, this seller is gonna feel a lot more comfortable to see a pre-approval letter because they already know they went through an underwriter and most things look really good, right? Mm. The downside of having a pre-approval letter is that it may take a little bit longer because it's not only me reviewing the documentation, but somebody else is going to be reviewing the documentation. So it won't be an immediately answer. But if we go with the pre-qualification no, uh, letter, you can come to my office, you can fill out the application online and within 24 hours or even like an hour, I can tell you right, right away if you get pre-qualified. So those are kind of like the advantages. Depending on the, on the market is when I would recommend using one issue to, you know, one letter to another. Or if your case is very difficult, you know, maybe bearable income, things like that, self-employment, 
uh, maybe really special situation, then in those cases, then I'll recommend to send it directly to the underwriter to make sure that you wouldn't have any issues in the future with your loan. Okay. Okay, so uh, we're still at the beginning process, uh, getting ready for that pre-qualification pre-approval. Uh, I come to see you. I'm assuming I come to your office or can you do it over the phone first or how do you normally do it? So I really leave that to the client's um, choice. Um, we have our office, I'm there at the office and I can take um, meetings face-to-face. -face. Even during the pandemic, I was taking meetings face-to-face. Because why? There are some clients that much rather have that comfort zone where they want to see the person who they're dealing with, especially in this, you know, you're buying a home. It's not like uh, you're buying um, something small. You're actually getting a lot of dev and there's a lot of questions. A lot of first time home buyers never gone to that process. So they want to see your financial representative help you face to face. So we can do that. But we also have a lot of millennials that don't want to go to the office and they just want to, you know, be able to apply online. So either way, uh, it's up to the client. We're there to help you. Okay. Uh, okay. So either way, I have to start uh, with the application process. Uh, what do I need to apply for a home loan? Great question. So like I mentioned before, there's three main categories, income, assets, liabilities, right? So what does that mean? So the income side uh, part of the application, if you work for somebody, meaning you're a W-2 employee, you're going to need the last two pay stops and the last W-2s, okay? Um, if you actually self-employ, meaning you're 1099 on your own, your own business, then I'm going to need the last two year taxes. OK, for the asset, I will need the last two bank statements showing that you have the money for the down payment or closing costs. And uh, the liabilities will be the part where, where I pulled your credit. So those are the three major categories that you're going to need to apply for a loan. OK, OK. Now, I'm going to ask this one. This is going to be a little um, out there. Okay, go for it. <laughs> uh, no, it's not really out there. Uh, for some types of income, you do plus up. So like, example of myself, um, retire, I'm a retired military member. So if I show you my uh, income and it's, you know, we'll, we'll just use a hypothetical, make it easy, $4,000 a month. Mm -hmm. Um, how do you do that plus up for veterans and retirees? Uh, when we're talking about plus up, meaning what? Like Hamas, well, or? Well, some lenders, because there is no taxes, um, that income is usually final. Yeah. So it's not 4,000 in gross, it's 4,000 gross and net. Right. So they go like, oh, well, if you were making this amount, that would come down to the 4,000. So they kind of plus it up. Yeah, so great question. Uh, so we're referring a non-taxable income. Mm -hmm. So what is non-taxable income? Let's talk about that first. So it's obviously how the word says income that you don't pay taxes. But what kind of income is that? Social security, you don't have to pay taxes. Mm -hmm. Child support is another income that is non-taxable. Uh, so it's depending on the program uh, that would actually help you qualify for a little bit more because they're taking into consideration that you're going to receive most of the money. Okay. Mm -hmm. So... For FHA loans, you can actually increase non taxable income up to 1.15%, uh, okay? So 15% higher. For conventional loans would be 1.25%. And for BA loans would be also 1.25%. Okay, excellent, excellent. So that way, if you're like out there, you're a veteran, uh, retiree, uh, maybe on social security, got a decent check, you can actually say like, uh, kind of use this as a guideline to help yourself get plus stuff. Okay. Well, good. That's a great question, Eric, because most people do not know that, right? And especially hmm. social security, you don't make tons of money when you get social security income. So the fact that you can increase it a little bit more, that, that would make a huge difference on your pre-qualification. Okay. Okay. Now, one other thing, uh, we're going to stick with veterans for just a second. For some odd reason, I love working with veterans. I don't know why. Uh, the COE, the Certificate of Eligibility, uh, I remember back in the good old days, you had to pull that yourself and go down to a VA office and stuff. 
does a veteran have to go searching for that stuff to do their COE anymore, or will you be able to do that? Great question. Obviously, if you have it already, it would be a lot easier because sometimes uh, the system doesn't pull it right away. But the advantage that we have right now, thank God for technology, is that we have access to it. There's been a few cases where it may take a little bit, you know, 24 hours. So if there's not an immediate match, then we have to do a little bit more homework. But if you have it, bring it please to your loan officer. If not, then we can help you. Okay. Okay. So we've sat down or did this over Zoom, did it over the phone, something. Uh, you've gone over all of my stuff. You've issued me my pre-approval, yay. Uh, we've gone to the shop for houses. I don't found my, my dream house here. And uh, my real estate professional has sent all the information over to you. This starts a, a new little process. Let's start talking about that process from the lender side. Right. So once you get your offer accepted, um, very important. Most people do not understand what this means, but you have to give the earnest money deposit. So what is an earnest money deposit? It's essentially um, you're telling the seller, Mr. Seller, I'm very um, sure about this transaction and this is how serious I am. And then you give a small down, you know, down payment uh, for that house. Uh, the seller is the one that dictates the amount of the earnings money. But just to give you an example, it could vary from a thousand to five thousand dollars. Really, all depend on the value of the property, right? We're talking about a million dollars. They're gonna ask you for a larger EMD, um, sometimes ten thousand dollars, right? But a lot of people confuse these, and they're like, "Wait a minute, do I have to pay my earnings money plus my down payment plus my closing costs?" And actually, no, that is not correct. The earnest money is actually uh, part of your down payment slash closing costs. So if you have to pay $20,000 for down payment and closing costs, and then you give an earnest money of $2,000, the day of closing, you only need to bring $18,000. So that money goes towards the total amount that you have to bring at closing. Okay. Okay. Well, I mean, uh, when you receive the information on the house, you start like the entire process and putting it through underwriting. And like, I believe the next step you're going to do is order up the appraisal. Can you talk about the appraisal? Okay. So actually, before I talk about the appraisal, it's good to mention um, the contingency dates. Okay. So when you have a contract, there's three major contingency dates. One of them is the inspection period that is this is actually between you and your realtor. Actually, Eric, can you touch um, about that? Because that's my more like of your area expertise. Okay, well, so now we're talking a little bit of Nevada law. So it's gonna differ in every single state. So I'm only talking Nevada. Now, uh, one thing we're gonna have is what's known as due diligence. And due diligence, you can cancel for any reason you feel like anything your heart desires. Matter of fact, you're allowed to go there and knock on all the neighbor's doors and go like, do you like living here? <laughs> Cancel for that. This time you may have investigated the school systems and go like, oh, they had uh, three school shootings. Oh, you know what? I don't want to live in that neighborhood. And one thing I do suggest people do, neighborhoods can look completely different at night and on the weekends. Mm -hmm. So you can go and at least drive around night, weekend, see if you like the vibe of the neighborhood. And a lot of times when you've made that decision, especially when you're making a snap decision, you don't think about what is it really going to take to get to work? Just because the traffic is good now, it may not be good the time you have to leave for work. These are things you have to think about because you don't want to sit there, spend all that money buy a house mm -hmm. and not be able to get to work or it takes you an hour. You just waste it all that time before you thought it was going to take 20 minutes. That's due diligence. Cancel for anything. Uh, next, you're going to have certain dates like your appraisal date. That is the amount of time uh, that you are given to um, get an appraisal done and get everything rectified between you and the seller mm -hmm. if it comes in low. So let's uh, talk about normal appraisals. Uh, you know, six, seven months ago, if an appraisal came in low, it was like, yeah, so what? 
give me money. <laughs> uh, normally, uh, if an appraisal comes in, uh, let's talk about if it just comes in and it's normal. Okay, you go on. Perfect. That will be the perfect world right there, right? Yeah, perfect world. Uh, next, you go like, well, what if it comes in way high? First of all, most appraisers are not going to um, let it come in way high uh, because they don't want the liability for, from it. Because let's say you bought a house that was five hundred thousand, and the appraisal came back at six fifty. Oh my goodness! I can go sell this house for six fifty. I got a great bargain. Because some people are bargain hunters, and they go and they go like, you know what? I'd rather have that extra one fifty. They put the house on the market. And then the house sells for five twenty. The appraiser doesn't want to come back to you. Uh, you coming back to them, going like, hey, you promised me this house was six fifty. They're going to uh, come somewhere around value. And they're try as best as possible to make value if it's low or something. And just real quick, for a VA loan, is really cool because they have what's known as tide water. And what tide water does is if the appraiser believes the house may come in low, you have 48 hours to try to prove that it can actually meet value. No other loan does that. So normally you're going to set the appraisal limit based on what the lender tells you. Different lenders can do different things. They have different relationships out there. Uh, it's going to be anywhere from, it's hard to believe, 10 days to about 21. So, and it's also taken into account what's the time of the year. What time of the year are we in now? If you were to put an offer on a house tomorrow and you're coming up on Thanksgiving or Christmas or New Year's, a lot of people are going to be shut down. You need to take that into account for all of your dates. Mm -hmm. Then you have your loan approval date. Uh, generally, I set that for about 25, and sometimes I'll set it to the day that it's going to close. And that is the time for the lender to uh, actually approve your loan. Now, you said, wait a minute, I have my pre-approval letter. No, there is somebody else in that uh, computation. Uh, she kind of touched on before, and we're going to get a little bit deeper here in a second the underwriter the right? underwriter some people may hate or love the underwriter by the way this is a side story guys but i was that person the hated person that everybody's afraid of and i did that job probably for 12 years so that's kind of one of the advantages that I can provide to my clients is that no every loan officer has that strong background as to think about as an underwriter because I was actually an underwriter thinking that way, right? And everybody gets a little scared of the underwriter because the underwriter is the one that can make your dreams come through or can kill your dreams in like five seconds, right? Um, but it's very important for the people out there that is trying to buy that if you have a good loan officer and a good realtor taking care of your transaction, you should not be worried about these days that we're talking about, right? Because actually our job as you uh, representatives to be paying attention on those days. Like if there's something wrong going into your file that your loan officer can talk with you, with the realtor to, you know, to actually come out with a plan so you don't lose that earnest money deposit. Because that's the thing. Once those dates expire, you may lose your earnest money if you don't get that loan. So you have to be very careful as to who you're choosing as your loan officer or realtor. And I'm going to have to do a little bit of confession here. Uh, it doesn't matter what NRS, Nevada Revised Statutes say. Remember, I'm talking Nevada here. Um, no title company in this state will sign off on you getting your earnest money back unless the seller signs off on it. Mm -hmm. So your EMD, the way you're supposed to be able to get it back is uh, based on you know your deadline. So one, you have that due diligence. If you cancel before due diligence, you're supposed to get it back. Mm -hmm. If uh, within your appraisal timeline, let's say you can't come to an agreement on the appraisal, then um, you can get it back on for that. If your loan is ultimately denied within the timeline, you can get it back for that. And then there's another way you can get it back. And that is if um, the house is in an HOA, you have five days after receiving the documents to say yay or nay if you want to live in that HOA. Mm -hmm. Hey, that's kind of cool. 
Yeah, uh, although uh, this is also part of the confession. The CNRs or the rules of the HOA are this big. So I wonder how many people are reading line by line. I mean, we recommend that, but it's a lot of reading. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but see, here's the thing. Because the, uh, the um, title companies, escrow companies, they, even though the law says you're supposed to get your money back, the seller needs to sign off. Mm -hmm. A lot of sellers have now ticked off. You've gone 15 days, their house has been off the market. Maybe they've been packing. They get salty. So here's the confession. There is a good chance that seller's not going to sign or they're going to try to negotiate for part of that EMD because they're salty now and they've lost money. But see, they don't get it either. But you don't get it. <laughs> well, where is it? Where is the money going? Uh, the money goes into a, what's known as a cheat. Now, technically, after one year, you can uh, apply to get to the get the money uh, from the state because they turn it over to the state after one year. But you know, it's better to try to you know get something worked out ahead of time. Uh, and here's, here's one that's really cool. I actually had a situation where we were like past everything. And from day one, I kept asking the listing agent for the SRPD, Seller Real Property Disclosure. Mm -hmm. Never get, every time it's like, I'll, I'll get it to you. Oh, I have a wedding to go to and all, all, this, all these excuses. Well, there is a statute in the NRS that says you have to have that within two days if you do not have it within two days, here's the secret. Due diligence has not started. Mm. Two days of what, Eric? Two, two days, days of offer acceptance. Of offers acceptance. Okay. It's so in you the have law. to get it right away. Which so you were able to get that EMD because you read the fine print. Yeah, yeah. So I knew what the uh, law said and I pointed it out to her. You could just see it. It's like the panic. I mean, because she actually did the whole, well, the way I see it is you've gone past all these dates. And I was like, no, I still have due diligence. And she's like, no, like, you don't. What do you that, need? Yeah, yeah. And I told her, showed her the law. And I was like, yeah, due diligence didn't start. And you kept saying, uh, pulling off, giving me the SRPD. So there's so all just to that rectify. Stuff. Okay, <laughs> just to clarify. So the due diligence start two days after no. you received the SRPD. No, no. due diligence starts the following day of um, offer acceptance. Offer acceptance is when all of the signatures have been ratified. So the last person signs, the following day, due diligence starts, but they have two days to get you the um, SRPD. If they do not, see this is what people don't understand, it does not, it basically halts the um, due diligence. And when they give it to you, it starts it again. Mm. So here's a perfect sample why not every loan officer or every realtor now there is the same. So this is where knowledge and education comes in handy. And you want to be with the people that know what they're doing, definitely. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so that's yeah. a great story. You were able to say the EMD just, just by knowing this law. That's very, very yeah, impressive. Yeah. I mean, there's others like um, when you go for your home inspection which should be done during your due diligence. Mm -hmm. Well, the law says all utilities must be on. There is a caveat to that. Uh, if the utilities aren't on or something got turned off by accident, your due diligence stops. Mm. So let's say, Eric, now I'm going to ask you this question. If you go and the utilities are not on. Do you have to send another addendum extending it, or that's not even necessary because it's already written there? You should send an addendum. Nothing in real estate counts unless it's in writing. A perfect example is if I was talking to Andrew here and I say, I'm gonna I'm willing to sell you my house for five hundred thousand dollars. Somebody comes along tomorrow and says, I'll buy it from you for five fifty. Then I sign a contract with that person. But we had a verbal agreement. Now, verbal contracts are normally enforceable, mm -hmm. except in real estate. It must be in writing. I can say anything to her saying, I'm going to 
sell my house to her, it does not count until it is actually in writing. With the one caveat again, if you're in sound mind, sound body. So if you're under duress, uh, you have been drinking, under drugs, uh, have a mental episode, any of those above, um, you do not have the mental state to form a legal contract. I'm not a lawyer, just got into law school with a full ride scholarship, but never went. <laughs> Very interesting. Hey, um, can you talk about what an SRPD means? I mean, we yeah. mentioned it, but I know a lot of people may have no idea what that means. Yeah, that's the uh, seller real property disclosure. That is where the seller is supposed to tattle and tell every single thing that they know about the house that is wrong with the house. Mm -hmm. If they falsify that document, anything well, that you have to, yeah, it, anything you have to do to rectify what they falsified, you can sue for those damages, treble. So three times the damages. Perfect example, um, I just took a listing. And uh, if you're looking at my little series I'm doing right now of how you're supposed to sell a house and things you need to do in this market. It's the listing where I am you know, putting everything that where I'm actually going in and like um, actually doing the rehab on the house. So it's going to look perfect and ready to sell. Well, there's an issue. There was a roof deck leak and we can talk more about how those roof deck leaks because they actually can get a little common. Well, it was fixed. And one of the things we did is all those, the indications from the roof deck leak that was repaired. So now you don't even see that there was a leak. But guess what? That must be disclosed. You can't just go, oh, everything's cool. Look how beautiful it. the paint is. There is no markings. Yeah, so you could be sued if you did not uh, tell anyone about that. Absolutely. So it's very important. You know, it's great that we're touching uh, the importance of that form because, yeah, they're about... I don't know, 12 questions, something like that. And people go, no, 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 without reading or no wanting to disclose that. Mm -hmm. But if something wrong happens in the property and they can prove that you knew about it, it's a big, big issue. So yep. make sure that you're selling a property that you are 100% honest and they can disclose anything that you know. If it's obviously something something that you didn't know, maybe a previous owner or mm -hmm. you know you had no knowledge, of course, that doesn't count against you, but um, yeah, very important. Great conversation, yeah. I'm even learning a lot of stuff myself, so. <laughs> and let's uh, end it up on one little thing here. We were talking about earlier, locking in interest rates. Yeah. Uh, so if I lock in my interest rate, and let's say some hot reason, interest rates go down as rapidly as they went up, and they go down to 5%, can I do something about that? Yeah, okay, so it all depends. Um, I feel like locking the rate is almost like going to the casino and gambling. It's 100% a gamble, right? None of us can predict the future. Obviously, as you law and officer, I'm always looking at what the market is looking like and what news out there can be affecting the rate. So we may have a little bit of idea, but again, none of us can foresee the future. So when you enter into contract, you have the option to lock your rate immediately. What does that mean? What is locking the rate mean? So for example, if I wake up you're into contract and the rates today are 6%, you have the option to lock it. And then you know that that's going to be you, you rate for the term of your loan, right? Mm -hmm. Even if the rate goes up to 7%, if you lock your interest rate, you're going to keep that 6%. However, there's also the bad side that if you lock today and then tomorrow the rates go down to 5.5, you cannot change the lock and go to 5.5. You're going to have to stay with the 6%. Okay? Oh, okay. Okay. So that's where you're gambling. You don't know what tomorrow's rate will be. So should I lock or should I float? That's how we call it. You lock or you float. Okay. Um, so this is when you need to talk to your loan officer talk about how the market is, what are the news that could be affecting that, and if you want to, you know, what would be the best strategy um, to lock on that. Right now, in today's market, I would say the market is very volatile. Um, any little news are making huge impact, and obviously we have tons of issues with inflation, which is making our rates to constantly go up. In this market, 
obviously in general, I would say it's better for you to lock immediately because you don't want to have a surprise Then tomorrow your rate is going to be a lot higher and maybe your payment is going to go up and actually you may no longer qualify, right? So you can stop qualifying from one day to another. So if you're already into contract right now, it might be a good idea to immediately lock. We also have other options that are very uh, unique is that, um, for example, for all those people that are buying houses under probate, uh, probates are usually uh, transactions that may take longer than 30 days, or even if you're buying a brand new home that they haven't built, sometimes those transactions can take even six months, right? So a lot of people like to have the peace of mind. They're like, hey, I would like to lock my rate for six months. But usually, okay, usually you only lock a rate for 30 days. 30, 45 days, that's kind of like the average. Why is that? Because the longer I need to lock um, a transaction, the more money this is going to cost me, okay? So if I need to lock something for six months, we can even do that. However, there's always going to be a higher cost for, the, for that locking. So that's when you have to analyze, is it really worth it for me to pay this amount of money and lock for six months, but I already know what rate I'm going to get? Or should I chance it and gamble it? And hopefully in six months, the race will go down, right? Okay. Um, yeah. So it's all about education and talking to your loan officer about it. Okay, well, wonderful. Well, thank you for coming back. And I think this has been a very fruitful conversation. If you have any questions, just go ahead, leave them below. It's probably a little bit better if you um, email them because I don't always get notified when there are comments below. And again, if you want to contact me, call, text, or email, info's in the info tab, get on the calendar down below. I will put all of Andrea's information down there so you will uh, be able to contact her if you have any additional questions. So we are coming into the ho holiday season. <laughs> Happy holidays. Merry Christmas. Happy Hanukkah. Happy Kwanzaa. And Happy Festivus. It's a holiday for the rest of us. See you guys. Love it. Well, thank you so much for having me. And remember, very important, our consultations are free. So even if you're not ready, we would like to hear from you. Maybe we can help you make your dreams a reality in the near future. Okay. Well, okay. thanks a lot, Andrea. Yeah, bye.